Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Space Week Live for Sunday, December 20th, 2020. Another big week leading up to a pretty quiet week. Let's take a look. Uh, last week, the ver actually, it was two weeks ago. I didn't mention it in, in last week's Space Week, but uh, I'll get to it now. The Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 vehicle, vehicle VSS Unity, uh, was launched from its carrier aircraft. Um, but it had to abort shortly after uh, it was released, so that flight was not uh, successful. But they, you know, they were able to uh, recover and get back down to the ground safely. But uh, yeah, Virgin Galactic has had a long road, and um, uh, you know they have some innovative designs, some very visually striking designs. But uh, uh, you know they're not quite not quite there yet. So good, good luck to Virgin Galactic um, getting that issue fixed. Last Monday, let's see here. Oh, on a personal note, finally, after five-ish months, I have my professional 4K monitor back. Um, <laughs> it was, um, uh, it had a, a small glitch where every once in a while it would go dark. And so I sent it back to the manufacturer, ViewSonic, for RMA. And uh, uh, it was damaged, it was cracked by uh, FedEx in shipment, but FedEx didn't want to pay up. So then began the process of going back and forth between FedEx and ViewSonic and waiting and following up and getting denied by F FedEx. And uh, anyway... ViewSonic finally, because I had been through so much trouble with this process, ViewSonic decided to uh, ship me a replacement, uh, make an exception to their policy to ship me a replacement, even though it was FedEx that broke it. And uh, the replacement arrived uh, broken. <laughs> so I RMA'd that one. And uh, uh, finally, finally, I, I got my 4K monitor back. So uh, that's why if the angle looks a little different, that's because my cameras located way on the top of the monitor which is actually quite large it's a 32 inch monitor so uh, i've got my big beautiful screen back um so last week monday uh there was a total solar eclipse it's the only total solar eclipse of 2020 and as with the previous total solar eclipse it uh, traversed the countries of chile and argentina in the far south of South America, and it um, uh, seems like they're hogging the eclipses lately, but uh, thanks to both NASA and uh, uh, timeanddate.com for, for streaming that, um, but uh, unfortunately the weather in southern, you know, southern Chile and Argentina is often not that great, and there were nasty storms and clouds all across the region during the eclipse, so not many people actually got a very good view of totality. Uh, as a matter of fact, here is the view from the official stream of the uh, observatory. Uh, this is sped up. You can see the uh, observation deck. I'm not sure exactly where that's located, but it's somewhere in Chile. But the observation deck, you can see it getting darker and darker, getting pitch black. And totality lasted about two minutes, even though they couldn't see it. And then it brightens back up. So I'm sure that was a great disappointment to the few folks who were able to actually uh, go there and try to check it out. Um, because, of course, international travel is greatly hindered by the whole COVID phenomenon, so not many people could come, like normally there's a whole um, eclipse tourism business of people that, you know, travel to uh, various locations around the world where they can view solar eclipses. Not so much this time, but uh, we'll get more. And 2024 is the big one, the next big one for uh, the United States and Mexico. Let's see. Um, I guess. So, uh, 
ah, yes, eclipse view from space. So while the view from the ground was largely um, uh, blocked by clouds, uh, the view from space of the ground, of the moon's shadow passing across the Earth, was unhindered. And so from a distance of approximately 22,000 miles uh, in geostationary orbit, the GOES West satellite, I'm sorry, this was GOES East, the GOES East satellite um, spied the shadow of the moon crossing the Pacific Ocean and across uh, Chile and Argentina. So uh, I went ahead and put together a video of that using super high resolution um, now this is an 8K, I'm not broadcasting this live stream in 8K, but this uh, time-lapse video is in 8K if you want to check it out on my channel. But I'll go ahead and play it for you here, it's just a, uh, like a minute long. One sec, let me fix the sound. Windows loves to do this to me. It just decided that it wanted to... Um... Oh, man. Now even my windows are lagging. What in the world? I need to reboot this sucker. All right, so let's try... Let me make sure this is looking at the correct... All right, let's try this again. Nope, oh, and we all know that outro. All right. So, um, yeah. So, going back a few years, SOHO, so SOHO, <laughs> or the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, was launched in 1995 into a halo orbit around the Earth-Sun L1 Lagrange point. Now, if you're not familiar, the Lagrange points are, uh, there are five Lagrange points around each orbital system, so each orbital um, uh, pair. So for example, the Sun and the Earth, there are five different points. One on the Sun side of the Earth, one on the opposite side of the Earth, one on the far side of the Sun, one, uh, what is it, 60 degrees ahead of the Earth in its orbit, and then 60 degrees behind the Earth in its orbit. These five uh, points, due to the complexities of orbital mechanics, are gravitationally stable, meaning you can actually orbit craft at those points way out in space. So the Earth-Sun Lagrange point is about a million, a million miles away from Earth toward the Sun, and SOHO has been uh, orbiting uh, uh, that point for 25 years. So SOHO simulates a total solar eclipse by blocking the sun's disk so that it can observe the sun's outer atmosphere, the corona, and monitor space weather. Uh, it's also provided a bonanza of comet discoveries. Uh, SOHO was designed to last for two years, but 25 years and more than 3,000 comet discoveries later, it's still providing valuable data about our parent, parent star. Now, the day before the eclipse, Thai astronomer... Uh, amateur astronomer Warachat Boonplad was looking through some images from SOHO. He spotted a new comet, now called C2020X3 SOHO. Uh, the eclipse provided, well, so that, so that comet was spotted in a SOHO image viewed from space. 
now the eclipse provided the first opportunity to actually see the comet from Earth because it was so close to the sun, since our atmosphere makes viewing objects near the bright sun impossible. The only time you can see objects that are near the sun is when there is an eclipse and the, the direct light from the photosphere is blocked and therefore doesn't uh, you know, bounce all around the atmosphere and, and block your view. Now, uh, here, oh, so, I'm sorry, here you go. So I'm actually, my head is on top of the, the comet, so that little fuzz you see there in the lower left with a slightly larger uh, uh, blow-up is the comet. Now, the, on the left is the Soho, Soho image. On the right is an eclipse photo from Andreas Moller, uh, which I guess he did get a pretty good view of the eclipse, but um, uh, that looks like he was actually, it looks like there's some, some clouds, I don't know, anyway. Um, here is a larger version of that, so all credit to Andreas Moller for this, but uh, yeah, so this is actually flipped, so if you go back here, uh, look at the image on the right, and look at the sort of swirl part of the corona that's on the lower left in this image. It's actually flipped from the the uh, uh, larger image. So here you see the swirl is on the upper right. And if you look, uh, it's basically straight up from the right edge of the corona, you'll see a little sort of red smudge. Uh, and that is the, the comet. So the comet is what's called a Kreutz sungrazer. Uh, the Kreutz sungrazers are a family of about 3,500 comets that are believed to have originated as a single very large comet that broke apart a few centuries ago. Kreutz sungrazers have wildly elongated orbits, while, perihe while perihelion brings them within a couple million miles of the sun's surface, traveling roughly 450,000 miles per hour. Their aphelion is up to 170 AU from the sun, and AU is the mean distance between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, that's more than four times farther away than Pluto. Some large Kreutz sungrazers, like 2011's Comet Lovejoy, managed to survive the slingshot around the Sun, but uh, smaller comets, such as C2020X3, are doomed to disintegrate. Now, I do have a time-lapse video, also on my channel, of Comet Lovejoy 2011, that was taken from uh, by an astronaut on an astronaut on the space station. So let's check this out. This is amazing. Even though this is from nine years ago, it's still it's a Christmas comet, so it's pertinent to this week, and it is um, also uh, really incredible uh, uh, footage. So, uh, if you get to go to space, you might just get to see something like that. Somebody commented on my tabs. Yes, I have a lot of tabs because I have a lot to talk about. So, um, uh, one more thing. A note about journalistic integrity. So, um, while it's cool that uh, a comet was first observed from the Earth during a total eclipse, it was not discovered during the eclipse. It was discovered the day before in a Soho image. So let's please be accurate with our headlines and statements, and we can still make it compelling without it being misleading. So saying that a comet was discovered during the 2020 solar eclipse, not correct. But maybe next time. Uh, back here on Earth, last Wednesday, the Chinese Chang'e 5 a lunar sample return mission landed in Inner Mongolia, which is actually in northern China. Um, you know, they tracked it down with infrared sensors on helicopters, 
And so China now has their uh, uh, a couple kilograms of uh, moon rocks and regolith, or soil, albeit not organic soil. Um, but uh, yeah, congrats to China on that. Hopefully they... I mean, that's that's the, the first lunar sample return since before I was born, um, which was a long time ago. So, yeah, congrats to China. Hopefully they make some of that material available to international researchers. Uh, they probably will. The Chinese scientific establishment is, is uh, um, fairly collaborative, I guess you could say. Uh, getting to rocket launches on... Um, what was it, Tuesday? Uh, the Russian Angara A-5 rocket's second test flight, coming six years after the first test flight, was a success. Let's check it out. different views of this launch. It's a good-looking rocket. Uh, so the Angara is intended to replace the um, Proton rocket. Now, there's a planned variant of the Angara called the, a, the Angara A5P, which will carry humans. Interestingly, the A5P will not have a second stage uh, and will use the crewed spacecraft to complete its orbital insertion from a slightly suborbital trajectory similar to the Buran or the Space Shuttle. Uh, the reason for this is, if there are any engine issues, they will be lim engine ignition issues, they'll be limited to the launch pad rather than having a possible engine ignition failure after stage separation, which could uh, potentially not only cause a hazardous condition, but also leave the crew stranded in orbit, which would not be good. Um, another planned variant is the Angara A5V, which will have a big hydrogen-fueled upper stage and a higher payload capacity. I like, I love that exhaust. It looks, uh, looks very nice. On Tuesday, Rocket Lab launched their electron rocket, Owl's Night Begins, with the Strix Alpha, the Japanese Strix Alpha Synthetic Aperture Radar Satellite, which we've uh, talked about on previous episodes. Let's check this out. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, Engine three, three, two... <laughs> I mean, uh, Rocket Lab is working on a, rec a on recovering their first stage boosters by uh, parachuting them down to either splash down or be caught by a helicopter. They did not do that this time, um, but uh, but they're working on that capability. They did they did parachute and splash down a, a booster on the previous launch. Then stop. The tabs playing. Okay. Then, also on Tuesday, uh, the third time's the charm for Astra Space. Uh, earlier this year, they lost their Rocket 3.0 on the pad, and Rocket 3.1 failed shortly after liftoff. Last Tuesday, though, Astra's Rocket 3.2 successfully launched and reached past the 100 kilometer Kármán line designating the boundary of space. Uh, it didn't quite achieve orbit this time, but the test launch was still considered a great success, and they gathered lots of data. 
Uh, Astra plans to fly their first satellite mission early next year. And uh, there's no audio here, but we can see some uh, views from the rocket as it ascended to space. Here's the payload fairing separation and the stage separation. Oh, cool. Fairings dropping away. So, it achieved its target altitude as the, and thanks to Psy, uh, whatever. <laughs> Psy, Psy, whatever. Uh, Psy News for, for, this caption. But uh, yes, so the rocket uh, achieved its target altitude, but not quite at orbital velocity. So almost there. Uh, then on Thursday, the... Um, there we go. Then on Thursday, the Indian Space Agency, ISRO, launched a PSLV rocket with the CMS-1 satellite. I didn't live stream it, and I won't show it here, because the last time I showed an ISRO launch, I got a copyright claim from, from Doordarshan, the Indian government-affiliated broadcaster. Uh, I read an article saying that ISRO launch broadcasts are considered public domain and that Doordarshan does not have any ownership rights to them. But that was uh, just an article, and I'd rather have an official statement from ISRO on the matter. Um, what I might do in the future is go ahead and stream the ISRO launches so that you good folks can see them, and then if I get another copyright claim, just take down the video, because the stream will have already been seen, so no, no, no. Then, on Friday, an Ariane Space Soyuz lifted off from Vostochny Cosmodrome in the far east of Russia with a batch of 36 more satellites for the OneWeb broadcast internet constellation similar to SpaceX's Starlink. Let's check that out. Прошел контакт подъема. Двигатели центрального и боковых блоков вышли на режим главной ступени. 10 секунд. Параметры системы управления ракеты носителя в норме. 20 секунд. Двигатели первого. So as you may be as you may be aware, um, Ariane Space purchases its Soyuz rockets from Russia, who manufactures them. Uh, sometimes they launch. Usually they launch from uh, the ESA's spaceport in French Guiana, South America but uh, sometimes they also launch from Russia. Uh, now, when they do, they normally launch from Baikonur Cosmodrome. Well, I should say from Russia's spaceport, because Baikonur is in Kazakhstan, not Russia. But uh, it used to be the Soviet Union, then they broke apart, um, which is actually why Vostochny exists, because, uh, and we've discussed this on a previous episode too, because Vostochny is actually inside Russia, and it is at a fairly southerly latitude for Russia, which is a very northern country, um, whereas Baikonur, uh, Russia has to pay Kazakhstan great sums of money every year to lease Baikonur, and uh, they want to get away from that, not only for financial purposes, but also um, for uh, security purposes, because they prefer to be able to launch their own um, their own rockets from their own soil, which is why the the classified Russian launches or the, the Russian government launches are all done from Plesetsk Cosmodrome, which is very far north, which is not efficient for equatorial launches um, or for low inclination or geostationary launches. So uh, they built at great expense, they built Vostochny Cosmodrome far to the east, literally like five time zones east of Moscow, um, and, uh, uh, and that's where this launched from. This was actually the first time that an Ariane space, uh, Soyuz took off from Vostochny. So this was a first for them. Now it should be mentioned that OneWeb went bankrupt earlier this year, which is why their, their constellation launches have been, 
uh, delayed, but I believe they were acquired um, and and resurrected, so or saved. So, um, uh, yeah, competition is good, and it's good to have multiple options uh, up there. We've got Starlink, we've got OneWeb. Uh, and then finally, on Saturday, a SpaceX Falcon 9 launched the classified NROL-108 payload for the National Reconnaissance Office. Now, um, I'll shut up for a second. Some great helicopter views of the launch. Now, unlike uh, most Falcon 9 launches, um, this time they fired a boost back burn and brought the first stage booster back down to land at the pad. Uh, normally it lands on a drone ship. I presume, I mean, it, it would, one could presume from that that uh, the reason they were able to do this is because the payload did not require as much fuel to be consumed in order to achieve its target uh, orbit, which left them more fuel to do the burst, boost back burn and uh, return to pad. Uh, it's, it's cheaper and safer for them to land at the pad than to land out at sea and then, you know, barge the, barge the booster back to port. Um, Let's we'll see if we can see the... Okay, here's separation. You can see the rocket flipping. They had some really cool views of the, uh, not only the boost back, well, there's a boost back burn, holy cow. Um, they got some really cool views of not only the boost back burn, but also the uh, RCS, th RCS thrusters poofing on the, ro uh, to, to maintain the rocket's orientation. Uh, that is a great shot. Let's uh, speed this up a little bit. Poof, 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 poof. <laughs> I love that. Pretty good tracking on the uh, the telescope camera there, as well. And then slowing it back down for the landing. Well, this was the entry burn. You see on screen three Merlin engines have relit and are currently. You saw the uh, the thrust just like pop off to the side there. That must they must be uh, vectoring it to uh, change the rocket's entry traje trajectory. So moving ahead to the landing. We see it approaching, and I'll go ahead and shut up again. We won't be sharing any views of our, of our second stage at the request of our customer. Stage one landing burn startup. There's that single engine relight. Here comes Falcon 9 for its fifth landing attempt stage two at landing zone one. Stage one landing like deploy. Stage two start of terminal guidance. And Falcon 9 does it again. That's that truly never gets old. So the reason they're able to they were able to show us live views of the descent to landing was because it landed back at the pad. When it's uh, you know way offshore, 
uh, landing on the drone ship, the they don't have a uh, a solid uh, uh, video feed from the rocket. So they had they do from the drone ship, but not the rocket. So I mean they could rig something to set that up, but it's not the their top priority. So congrats to SpaceX on that very cool launch, even though it was just another spy satellite. Um, every launch gets us closer to, uh, what do they say, normalizing uh, uh, space flight. So looking ahead to this week, um, on Monday, so tomorrow, Monday, December 21st, is the solstice. The shortest day of the year for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, and the longest for those in the Southern. Uh, by pure coincidence, tomorrow will also feature a very special great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. As you may already know, uh, the closer orbits move faster. We orbit the Sun faster than Mars, which orbits faster than Jupiter, and so on. Every 20 years or so, Jupiter catches up with Saturn and passes it in the sky. This is called a great conjunction, Jupiter and Saturn being the biggest planets in our solar system. Uh, it has no metaphysical or cosmic significance. It's not going to have any disturbing effect on gravity, magnetism, or geopolitics. It just means that from the vantage point of Earth, the two largest planets in our solar system are roughly lined up. Now, this great conjunction is special, though, because it's been nearly 400 years since Jupiter and Saturn were this close in the sky and 800 years since it happened at night when people could actually see it. Now, they're actually quite far away. I mean, they're normally far away, but they're particularly far away now because uh, Jupiter and Saturn are close to the sun in our sky, which means that they're on the other side of the sun. So we have uh, a couple Earth's orbit distances away uh, plus their normal distance. But uh, we still get to see them close together, and uh, you may have noticed them growing closer over the past uh, couple of months. But um, let's see. Uh, yeah, tomorrow they will be within a tenth of a degree of each other. They'll be right next to each other. Uh, so because they, are cl they appear fairly close to the sun, you don't have a huge window of time to view them, so make sure to catch them right after sunset. Um, and actually, I'm going to set my alarm. Also, uh, if you have clear skies tonight, um, make sure to go out and see them, because just in case you have uh, cloudy skies tomorrow. Now, this here is a photo that I took uh, two nights ago, I think, where well, you can kind of see Saturn, fuzzy Saturn on top, and you can def well, I mean, you can't see much much uh, detail on Jupiter, but um, I was having issues with my focus, and I we had lots of clouds in the area here, so um, my window was very narrow. I only had a few seconds uh, in which I could take the photo, but this is this is what I got. Now this is not like I wish that I was able to do some better processing on this, but I'm actually having issues with my Adobe Lightroom that prevent <clears throat> that prevented me from. Uh, 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 from enhancing the 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 uh, the background the brightness or whatever, because I, I could in the photo I actually could see the four big moons of Jupiter sort of lined up. Um, you can't see my mouse, but uh, sort of lined up at sort of a north northwest direction as we see it here. Um, but Yes, and I should note, uh, this picture was taken with my brand new lens doubler that I purchased um, a couple months ago, but it was, it was on back order, and it finally got shipped. And so, um, instead of a 600 millimeter lens, I get to have a 1200 millimeter lens, which is not bad. It, it's not equivalent to uh, a good telescope, but it gets the job done, and, um, you know... So, uh, yes, looking forward to that. Hoping we have clear skies uh, tomorrow. I think it may be cloudy today, but hopefully tomorrow. And I'll try to get some better pictures for you. Um, Evan McGregor, can I see them on the 25th? Uh, yeah, they'll be... So if we go back to the, to the V graphic here, you see um, 
the 25th. That's uh, four days after the 21st. So if you see the 16th, which was five days before the 21st, they were still very close together. Um, yeah, so what you see here, this is probably roughly equivalent to what you'll see on the 25th. So, um, let's see. Oh, Ice Vogel, do I have to collimate? Which one do I have? I, I use my DSLR, um, uh, my, my camera, my old trusty Nikon D90, which is about 10 years old. Uh, but I do have a nice Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter uh, lens on it, plus the, the, um, the lens doubler, the Tamron lens doubler, which uh, allows me to have an effective focal, range, focal length of uh, 1200 millimeters. So, uh, there is actually only one launch this week, and, that, uh, and there won't be live coverage of it. Uh, on Monday, so tomorrow at 11.29 p.m. Eastern, 4.29 a.m. GMT on the 22nd, a Chinese medium-lift Long March 8 will launch a classified technology validation payload called uh, XJY-7 into a sun-synchronous orbit, plus a couple of ride shares. Tianqi-12 the first demonstration satellite in what's planned to be a constellation of 38 satellites providing Internet of Things communications, and ET Smart RSS, an Ethiopian Earth observation CubeSat. Uh, again, there won't be live coverage of that. Um, that is that is it for this week. It's a quiet week. Uh, there's the, the conjunction, and then the Chinese launch, and that is about it. Now, on Friday, December 25th, Make sure to drink lots of eggnog <laughs> with whatever additives you think are, are, are appropriate. Um, uh, yeah, so this is Christmas week. There's, there's really not much going on. Um, make sure, yeah, make sure to stay safe. Stay socially, di socially distanced if you can. Um, you know, take, take measures. We don't want to have a, uh, an explosion of, of uh, uh, COVID because you know, families were unsafe. Um, so stick it out, you know, and hopefully we'll, we'll come out, uh, infection free on the other side. Now, um, I also wanted to note that at long last, so as you probably know, I collect a lot of satellite images. I have over four terabytes of, um, data just from the goes east and goes west satellites. The, the, the NOAA satellites. And um, plus I have images from Himawari 8. I have the entire collection of the lifetime collection of images from uh, Discover Epic, which I, I believe is still non-functional. And, um, uh, and for uh, ever since the beginning of the year, I have wondered if the Russian Electro L satellite images were publicly available and I just recently discovered the site where they are located uh, the full 11,000 pixel by 11,000 pixel uh, uh, Electro L images which is very cool because now I have um, a fourth uh, geostationary satellite with ultra resolution images that I can make time lapses out of now, the, the images that Electro L produces, they're not visual, um, they're not in the, the normal visual range. Here, let me go big and go home. <laughs> they're not, so the, the, the light wavelengths that the Electro L satellite uh, observes are optimized for viewing like vegetation and, and for whatever scientific purposes that the uh, satellite is used for. So they're not going to look like the same coloring that you would see with your own eyes, but they're still uh, very high resolution and very cool. Um, all right. Oh, <laughs> Evan McGregor. Um, mess me message me on Discord. Here, I'll put a link to Discord. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, you know where it is, but... but uh, Others might not. So message me on Discord. I'll, I'll provide you uh, a link. So, um, yes, questions. 
Uh, if you have any questions, I should have mentioned this before, if you have any questions, make sure to tag my name, Ross Space, and uh, I will be sure to see them. So, uh, Evan McGregor, one thing I did notice is the camera is a little laggy, looks 15 FPS almost. I'm not sure which, uh, which video that was referring to. Okay, Eclipse time lapse. Uh, Evan McGregor, raw, that's amazing. Is that a time lapse view? So what I do a lot of times with the satellite time lapse or with the satellite images is I make what I call a. We just got some clouds here. Let me see if I can increase the light. I noticed that. There we go. <laughs> I noticed that um, I was getting pretty good light from the window earlier. And so I actually didn't turn on my stream lights, but uh, I'm kind of losing the light now. So um, there you go. Uh, I need to work on my green screen illumination because um, uh, there's this big shadow cast by my noggin that uh, causes a, uh, a, a shadow on the green screen that doesn't, doesn't uh, chroma out very well. So anyway... Um, so what I do is I take these huge satellite images, uh, sequ whole, big sequences of them, thousands of satellite images, and um, uh, I actually apply slow motion processing to them so that it's kind of a slow motion time lapse. It's still faster than real time, much faster than real time, but it's slowed down from, like, if a satellite takes a photo every 10 minutes, if you play that at regular speed, let's say at 24 frames a second, so that it looks smooth to you, uh, the it's going to be the, the day-night cycle is going to be progressing quite fast, you know, kind of too fast to catch any detail. But by applying some slow motion processing to the video, uh, we're able to sort of mentally absorb or visually absorb what's going on better. Uh, you do get a little bit of distortion because it's having to interpolate the frames, but it it uh, it's still a very a very cool result. Um, <laughs> Evan McGregor, with that iconic intro, are you going to make a new version using the new Apollo angles? Um, iconic intro. You mean the uh, the. Uh, the raw space intro uh, sequence, or my command uh, deck here. Uh, is your head a comet? My head is, yes, my head was a comet. Uh, my head is in the, my head is beyond the clouds. My head is in space. My hair is beautiful. Thank you, Maria Kutujan. <laughs> uh, I ruffled it just for you. Um, <laughs> Uh, Christine Gray, a.k.a. James. What are moon rocks? Last time I checked it was cheese. Yes, the moon is in fact made of cheese, and it is very exclusive. Um, comes from the Lunière district of, of France. Kidding. Uh, ETH Nick. Which countries are OneWeb going to give or supply internet to? I'm not actually sure where their uh, projected customer base is located. Uh, I mean, these satellites will cover most of the world, so, um, yeah, I'm not actually sure what, and, and the co the um, uh, coverage is going to rely on negotiations on a per-country basis, uh, just like Starlink, because even though the satellites are flying over everywhere, basically, um, in order to provide service in a given country, they have to have an agreement with that country to provide service there. Um, okay, I already answered some of those. 408 years since uh, the last conjunction, the last great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn this close. Now again, they pass each other every 20 years or so, but they're, they don't, they're not usually this close together. Um, Mark Desaire will stick to Gluhain. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what that is. Um, oh, they're saying my webcam FPS. That's interesting. 
Looks good to me. Let me... No? Even in the playback, it looks good to me. Maybe it was just lagging earlier. Is it okay now? Anyway, uh, Evan McGregor, also a dual softbox system from Amazon, should solve your green screen problems if the lights are behind me. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I'm, a, I'm a photographer, and you would think that I would have fewer problems with my studio setup, uh, but uh, I am primarily a, uh, a an outdoor photographer. <laughs> But uh, the problem with illuminating the green screen is that there's this big, huge body in the way that is me. And if I place a light behind me, it's going to be so close to the green screen that uh, it's going to be practically on top of me. I mean, I've thought of actually mounting a light to the back of my chair, which is a possibility. But <laughs> Literally, that, that, may, that may do the trick to actually mount a light to the back of my chair to illuminate the green screen. Um, but, uh, yeah... Uh, and I have some huge soft boxes for uh, studio photography, but they are quite large and they would not even begin to fit in my little office space here. Uh, Emery Hurst, do you think the Chinese will be able to successfully land the lower stage of the Long March 8? Uh, not currently. Uh, that, that, that may be in the future. Um, I mean, I know China is working on <clears throat> a booster landing capability, but it's, they're, not, they're not there yet. All right. Um, oh, snow kittens. Never heard of Gluhuang. Wow, someone needs some Northwest European culture. You wound me because uh, the, the greater part of my uh, ancestry is from Norway. So... I have uh, Northwestern European roots. I just, uh, in fact, I have a, uh, a family tree uh, drawn out by hand, uh, framed and put up on my wall that goes back a couple hundred years. Uh, and my family comes from a strong Norwegian background. But I don't really know anything about the, uh, the history or culture there, so... Uh, sorry for that. Um, Ian Pedler, 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 is your spaceship capable of warp drive? I haven't tried it yet, but I shall have to give it a go. Um, <laughs> let's see here. You know what? Let me... Okay. So it looks like for the outro, um, I did not have the... Uh, you know what? I'm going to do this. Hold on a second. Thanks for watching. There we go. That'll work. All right. FTP link. Yeah, the process of down Evan, Evan McGregor regarding the uh, source for those um, Electro L images. Um, the the process is is it's not it's it's more it's less straightforward than the process for the uh, Himawari or the Goes uh, images because you've got to download a great big FTP I mean a great big zip file from an FTP site then you've got to extract the zip file um, in which there are multiple images and you only need one of them uh, the RGB image which you then is then quite dark. And in order for it to look sort of normal to our eyes, you have to perform, a, a, you know, a, a, some image processing on it for it to look like a, a normal brightness for, for our uh, aesthetic purposes. But um, Ice Vogel wonders if SETI is still in use. Well, one of the big SETI radar, uh, radars was Arecibo, which sadly uh, collapsed a couple weeks ago. So that, that is no longer available. There's still the VLA, the Very Large Array in New Mexico, which I've been to and is very cool. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the search for extraterrestrial life is uh, still going on, but uh, they lost one of their prime 
you know, sources for, for signals. All right, I think that will about wrap it up for this week. Um, so thank you all for coming. Have a great Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, uh, whatever your holiday is, or even if you just get time off, even if you don't get time off, enjoy your week. And um, I hope to see you again next week. And until then, keep it raw, take care, and toodaloo.